Good morning, everyone. Good morning, live viewers, replay viewers. Good morning, whether you're watching on this on the uh, on the web or on an application. Um, my name is Randy Lyman. I'm the pet uncle. I'm a pets and animals reporter uh, and co-owner of Style Pets, an online pet boutique at uh, stylepets.boutique. You are watching Wag of the Tail, my weekly variety magazine show about animals and the difference that people and animals make in each other's lives. We often speak about animals uh, being intelligent, but what does that really mean, animal intelligence? Is, or what does intelligence mean? Is there a single type of intelligence or are there different kinds of intelligences? Um, could there be more than one kind? Thank you. Welcome to all those who are just, just joining. Um, you can put your comments down below um, and I can see them and respond to them during the course of the show. And if you'll just say hi, we can see who's here. So I appreciate that. Hi, Diana. How are you? Um, uh, many animals we know. Oh, hello, Kyle. How are you? Um, we know that many animals possess heightened senses of smell, uh, sight, and other senses that are familiar to us. Uh, many animals seem to possess uh, senses that we can scarcely even imagine, like migrating birds who seem to use, be able to sense the Earth's magnetic fields or, or fly by the stars on their on their large uh, on their long mi migrations. And we describe them as having a certain um, intelligence that humans don't have. Uh, but research has shown that uh, many animals seem to engage in behaviors that require thought, not necessarily sort of rational thought in the way that we think of it, but maybe yes. And we see tool use among animals, we see communications among animals, and this doesn't, this isn't any restricted to any type. We see it among birds, among fish, amphibians, mammals, all types of uh, um, animals. And so in today's show, we're going to be looking at the phenomenon of animal intelligence and look at the many different kinds of intelligence uh, that animals display. Um, hi, Therese. Hi, Monique. Thank you for, for joining. Um, but first, before we get into today's topic, as usual, the news. Cat Table 2.0, and that's spelled capital C, capital A, capital T, and then the word able, like Cat Table 2.0, has been described as the perfect storage system for pets. It is uh, as you can see, a series of blocks, there are four different versions that you can pile up and stack in a variety of different ways. Um, this has sort of just recently come on the market. Cat architecture, or cat cat detecture, as it is known, has become quite a phenomenon. And if you look on Pinterest, you can see all kinds of designs and people have and things that, you know, just things that are built up on the walls, those steps and shelving and, and little bridges and so on, that just make a home a real place for for cats. It's a whole sort of new wave in architecture designing for your cat. Well, a couple years ago, and I got to thank, yes, it is stylish, but wait till you see, oh, wait till you see what you have to get. This this came out before this, this was a cat table 1.0, came out a couple years ago, but now it's actually available on the market. This is for cats. You know how cats love to sit up on your keyboard and right in front of you while you're working? Well, there is a table that is designed for cats. It's about six inches thick and it has sort of an internal maze built into it so the cat can just crawl around throughout the table. This has won major design awards, international design awards. Um, even uh, people for the ethical treatment of animals, PETA has given this an award uh, for thinking it really represents. So this is what yeah, this is what cat owners, especially who work at home, uh, really need is a table that their cat can just climb around in inside. These are, uh, as I looked on the web, there, there's a limited a number of them available, I guess, or it's a limited edition. They're like $4,800 to get one of these things. Um, but in terms of the uh, productivity that you will gain back by not having a cat sit on your keyboard, it's probably worth the money. And um, yes, maybe Milton will get stuck in that, but Shamalama would like it. Yes, exactly. Uh, in in other news, at the down at the mouth of the Amazon River in Brazil, scientists have just discovered a coral reef in the uh, mouth of the Amazon River that may represent an entirely new type of ecosystem. R reefs typically exist in, in clear water where they can get sunshine, sunlight filtering down through the water. The Amazon, which accounts for 20% of the 
amount of water that rivers discharge into the ocean worldwide. The Amazon accounts for one fifth of that. And you can see it's just so muddy in the mouth of the river, it can be seen from outer space. And here you can see the sort of dividing line. This is the waters of the Amazon meeting the waters of the sea. Muddy waters are not a place for coral reefs to survive, and yet a coral reef the size of Delaware has been discovered beneath, not in, but beneath the muddy waters of the Amazon River, and scientists have just barely begun to explore it. They've already discovered something like two or three dozen totally new species of animal, uh, you know, fish and plant, uh, fish, plant life, and so on. It's just, it's a coral reef that nowhere no one would have thought to look there. Um, it, it must rely on other things other than sunlight to filtering down through the water. We've only just begun to, to, to um, even know it's there, much less discover it. But yes, an entirely new kind of ecosystem discovered in the muddy mouth of the Amazon River. And finally, it is baseball season, and this is the year that you can actually take your dog out to the ballpark, not just the park. Um, PetSmart is having a, a, what they call their Bark at the Park, where throughout the baseball season and across the country, they are having dog events at selected baseball games where you can bring your dog and what they are trying to do. In fact, in Phoenix, Arizona, they fell just short of the Guinness World of Guinness Book of World Records for um, number of animals, number of dogs at a sporting event. They had more than 850 dogs show at, uh, up at a game of the Arizona Diamondbacks, where apparently, I guess, they parade the dogs around on the ballpark before the game starts. And they will be coming to, um, they, let's see, they'll be in Los Angeles on July 9th. They'll be here in Oakland on July 22nd, um, Denver in August, and Houston on August 8th. 28th so you can go check out your local schedules at the you buy the tickets just as normal through your the baseball team's website or however you know their baseball team's box office but you can bring your dog to the ball game this um this year uh sponsored by pet smart and some other organizations and they um you have to like fill out a form online indicating that you've been to the vet uh, been to the vet that you know sort of your dog has his proper shots and all that. Um, yes, Denver. Go to a baseball game in Denver. It's August 16th. So um, check out your local baseball team schedules. You buy your tickets. If you want to bring uh, Kaylee, you have to, like I said, fill out some forms first to do that. But other than that, if you just want to go watch, um, all you need is a um, just a ticket to the ball game. So take your dog to the park. I've got links to all these uh, stories and to the Bark at the Park event on uh, the show notes at uh, wagofthetail.live um, where I keep a, an archive of all my shows. Um, you have Bark in the Park twice a year in Atlanta. Oh, well, PetSmart is taking it around the country now so everyone can get a chance to bring their uh, dog to the ballpark. So if you're just joining us, um, today's episode is Smart Animal Planet. We're looking at the phenomenon of animal intelligence and, and looking at all the different uh, kinds of ways that animals turn out to be way more uh, intelligent than humans had, had previously thought. Um, I'm Randy Lyman, the pet uncle. You can follow me on Periscope, Twitter, uh, read my blog at thepetuncle.com and email me at randy at um, thepetuncle.com. So... Contrary to one popular theory, animals probably did not learn to use tools from an obelisk that fell from the sky like we saw in the movie 2001. However, uh, as great a story as that was, it was just a story. However, animals have displayed some really mysterious and really miraculous forms of intelligence, like this photograph of uh, humpback whales doing what's called... Um, uh, they use what's called bu bubble nets to catch fishes. And what they do is a group of humpbacks will get together near a school of fish. They will, one of them will go beneath and blow bubbles and force the fish up to the surface. And then the rest of the whales swoop in and then just eat them all. Pretty astonishing um, feat of just sort of cooperative hunting uh, among humpback whales that obviously requires thought, planning, just a, having a real game plan in short. Cockatoos are called the master burglars of the animal world for their ability to actually pick locks 
Um, there was one study where uh, a cockatoo actually, to get the nut that was inside the box, actually removed a pin, unscrewed a screw, unfastened a bolt, turned a wheel, and then shifted a latch to get, um, to get the food inside. Figured it out unassisted in two hours. Goldfish uh, apparently not only listen to music, but can actually tell the difference between uh, uh, different composers. How they do that is beyond me. And dogs, of course, dogs are one of the most intelligent animals that we know of. I'm not going to go into them much here because that deserves a scope all its own. Um, but everyone is quite familiar with uh, the, the intelligence of dogs and their ability to learn and to, to do all kinds of things, either together and with humans. But what is intelligence? Um, it's been defined in a lot of ways, um, including your capacity for logic, abstract thought, communication, learning, memory, creativity. Um, but there are other, may, other, as I said before, other kinds of intelligence that birds may seem to um, be able to detect the Earth's magnetic fields and, and steer their way on migrations by means of that. Some animals can recognize themselves in a mirror, like chimpanzees, dolphins, elephants, and magpies. So land, sea, and air, the ability to recognize yourself in a mirror is not uh, restricted to um, any one of those places. It, it crosses all species. But being able to recognize yourself in a mirror um, sort of ask the next question of, well, do these animals then have a sense of self-identity? And what does, what does that mean? Um, what would be the implications of animals really having a sense of self? Well, it turns out there are probably many different kinds of intelligences. And a Harvard uh, professor, Dr. Howard Gardner, in 1983 uh, proposed a theory of multiple intelligence in which he suggested that the traditional notion of there is one intelligence that can be measured by an IQ test is far too limiting. That in fact that there are, he identified eight different types of intelligence. There's linguistic, people just learn better through words, or there may be logical, intelli or mathematical intelligence, that people just get numbers, or spatial intelligence, or sort of a bodily kinesthetic intelligence where you just sort of learn things physically but you maybe can't get them, you know, mentally or verbally or, or numerically. And educators, of course, love this theory because it confirms for them that if you can't teach a child one way, there are seven other ways that are possible. So this has been applied to, to humans, not necessarily to animals. However, there is a book that I have just been reading called The Smartest Animals on the Planet, which defines, this has been done by a researcher who has been working with uh, animal cognition for like 35 years or more, who has identified seven different kinds of uh, intelligences that animals display, such as the use of tools, the ability to communicate, which is not necessarily the same as the ability to understand language. Um, there's numerical skills, there's uh, self-recognition uh, in a mirror. And so in the, throughout this book, um, the author takes us, this is a doctor, what's her name, uh, Dr. Sally Boyson. She um, takes us through the whole range of the animal world and looks at um, animals that uh, display these different kinds of in intelligences. And a really cool thing about the book is it describes a lot of the experiments that were used to figure these things out. And it really just sort of shows step by step so you can see the kind of tests that many animals were put to to um, uh, figure out their intelligence. So we're just going to take a survey of a, a number of these different things um, and can't go through the whole book. It would we'd be here for hours. But uh, just want to hit some of the highlights of some of the different um, things uh, highlighted in the book about the different kinds of ways that animals exhibit intelligence. Um, ground squirrels have the ability to um, have different calls to warn of different kinds of predators for whether the predator that's coming up is on the ground or up in the air. Um, also, uh, vervet monkeys do the same kind of thing. They, in fact, have three different kinds of uh, warning calls to warn members of their family or group um, what kind of predator is on the way. It's one kind of call if it's a leopard. Um, and then in which case the monkeys run up into trees and get onto small branches that the leopards can't climb uh, out to. Uh, there's a different warning call if it's a snake. So then the animals will stand up and look to see where it is. And then a different kind of warning call um, if it's an eagle or some other airborne um, predator 
uh, in which case the monkeys will run into the, the bushes and hide. So, and they do this by all, it's all in the way that they vocalize. It's three different calls. And some animals, like other kinds of birds, have learned to recognize the warning calls of certain other animals. So, um, uh, another type of monkey that can distinguish these calls, well, the hornbill birds can recognize um, what kind of predator it is. If it's a ground predator like a leopard, they don't care, they don't move. But if it's an airborne predator like an eagle, then they get out of the way. So animals can recognize warning calls. Dolphins and whales, long known to have whistles. Dolphins have their whistles, which may convey a lot of information about the, indiv the identity of the individual who's calling. The dolphin whistles remain a mystery. Same thing with whale songs and the sort of repeating patterns and the changing of, of whale songs. Again, observed, they clearly seem to be some sort of communication. We haven't figured out what it all is. But um, whales, like elephants, other very large animals, tend to um, also uh, communicate by means of infra infrasound. Infrasound is very, very low frequency sound below the range of human hearing. Dogs and cats can hear above the range of human hearing. Elephants, whales, um, other animals like um, giraffes, rhinos, uh, alligators can sense infrasound, infra that's so hard to say, um, which carries uh, long, long distances. Um, infra, that's the reason that, for example, you need to be close to an FM radio station to hear it, but you can pick up AM radio hundreds of miles away because AM radio has shorter frequency and therefore longer wavelengths and therefore carries much farther. And uh, it's believed that animals can, or the elephants in particular, can actually sense these infrasound frequencies that are made vocally, but perhaps elephants can um, sense them through their feet since infrasound will cause the ground to, to vibrate. Uh, beyond communication, there's also uh, the use of numbers. Um, even if an animal cannot actually count, the ability to um, be sensitive to quantity can actually be uh, a very valuable survival skill. And in fact, um, chimpanzees, which have a range of, have been shown to have a range of numerical skills and counting skills and just all sorts of mathematical skills beyond any other animal, um, in uh, laboratory, um, you know, clinical uh, experiments, all animals tend to go to figure that more um, between two quantities, they'll always choose the bigger one and they always choose more. Um, that is just sort of a, a, a natural um, thing that, that, that happens uh, across. But chimpanzees have a very wide range. They've been shown that they can actually recognize numerals, learn to count, learn to understand quantities. Um, Saharan ants in Africa, in the, uh, um, uh, in the Sahara Desert in, in Northern Africa, have been shown that they uh, seem to have an internal pedometer that tells them how far that they have actually gone <clears throat> from their nest to a food source. Um, that they, um, and a very ingenious experiment kind of showed how this might be true, because think about it, out in the desert, there are no landmarks to tell you where you're going. You can't rely on visual cues to know how far in which direction the sands are shifting. But ants seem to have an internal pedometer, and um, that enables them to sort of count the number of steps that they take using their standard stride as the measuring uh, stick. And, and some researchers figured this out. They took some ants and they shortened the legs by cutting off some of the legs, but other ants they gave stilts. So in other words, to change the length of the stride. When these ants were taken to uh, away from their nest and then walked back, the ones with the shorter legs did not make it as far, and the ones with the longer legs actually overshot the goal. In other words, they took the same number of steps, but because the stride length was different, they got lost and disoriented at first. So it seems that ants, um, yeah, that's extremely sophisticated, and who knows how the ants actually do this. Probably not rational thought, they're probably not counting, well, but who knows, really. Um, but they seem to have an ability to, to count the number of steps that they take. East African lions, um, actually, uh, because their uh, roars may also and seem to also be individually, to identify individuals, 
they are able to let a, by all of uh, the, the lions in a pride roaring, they are able to actually let intruders on their territory know how many lions they're actually up against. And it's been shown that if animal, that if lions hear the roar of say three or four lions as opposed to just one, they're much more cautious in, in approaching that they seem to be able to tell how many other lions there are that they're about to face. And, and they can also, and this also would indicate to other members of the group who are farther along how many intruders there are, and, and it, it can be used as a way of calling for help. Uh, rats, like chimpanzees, have been shown to make all kinds of numerical judgments, not necessarily, well, not necessarily to count numerals, but to be able to use counting to predict the outcomes of certain things. And rats may also have an internal timer that uh, shows, you know, that. Uh, uh, tells them to say wait a certain amount of time in order like press the lever and the food will come in 15 seconds rats seem able to um, uh, be able to determine lengths of time as well as uh, have other numerical skills when it comes to tools you know it used to be said that um, the use and making and use of tools is what distinguished uh, humans from other species well you can throw that idea into the so-called dustbin of history Many animals um, have shown an ability to not only use but make tools. The uh, family of um, birds called corvids, which includes ravens, magpies, crows, um, has been shown not only to have a wide range of, of numerical and counting abilities, but to be able to use food like twigs to get to uh, food in hard to reach places, like picking up a twig in their beak and poking it in holes to get the termites out. They have been, some have been shown to actually um, uh, sort of ma not manufacture, manufacture tools, but to modify tools, like to bend at the end of a twig to put a hook in it so that they can um, pull things out. Some seem to actually carry their tools with them so they don't just make them as they go along. Chimpanzees, it turns out, have an extensive um, range of tools at their disposal. They have chimpanzees around the world have been observed using something like 35 different tools, including hammers and anvils, scoops, sponges. They've even been seen using um, spears by using their teeth to sharpen the edge of a stick and then go hunting for uh, these uh, smaller primates called bush babies that live in trees. Yes, chimpanzees have been seen to go spear hunting. Um, orangutans and gorillas, the other uh, types of, of um, major primates not um, really known as tool users, but it has been seen, but the chimpanzees are absolutely the, the major tool users of um, the primate world uh, after humans. Capuchin monkeys in South America have been seen to use tools and more than just use tools, you know, these have uh, opposable thumbs and they can move their fingers independently, which is unusual for primates. So they have a kind of precision grip that's similar to what humans have. And they have been seen to um, modify, you know, twigs and branches to create tools in a way that suggests that they are able to understand what features a tool is going to need in order to accomplish the task that they want to perform and then modify a tool to create those features. So they are able to look at something and go, all right, it needs to be this long, it needs to be hooked here, it needs to do this. They seem able to actually assess the situation, determine what kind of tool they're gonna need, make it, um, and, and then use it. A pretty phenomenal set of cognitive skills that you can only call intelligence in some fashion, even if we, uh, then quite possibly they're using the same kind of thought process that humans, that humans do. Uh, and then, uh, when it comes to intelligence, there's a kind of social intelligence that um, a lot of animals, especially those that um, live in groups, in complex societies, um, need to have. You know, animals that are loners don't necessarily need to have these kind of uh, social skills, but chimpanzees, dolphins, lions, elephants, they all uh, li um, live in societies and groups. And so they've developed a certain kind of social intelligence. Um, Things like reciprocal altruism, like I help you now and you help me later, it's been seen but not conclusively enough to be able to say that yes, animals do this. But 
processes of reconciliation and arbitration have been seen uh, among chimpanzees where maybe two chimpanzees will fight but then they'll make up later or a third will come in and cause the two to um, to reconcile this kind of um, um, behavior of course is is necessary for a, a society or a group to continue to get along so many animals that live in in groups have developed a kind of social intelligence as well so that was just sort of a, a quick survey of some of the things that you will find in this book uh, the smartest animals on the planet by dr sally boyson um it's just uh, was revised and updated a few years ago but it's absolutely fascinating. I highly recommend um, taking a look at this book. There is a link to it on the show notes uh, for this show um, uh, that you can uh, get the, the link directly. It's easily easy to find on Amazon. It's called The Smartest Animals on the Planet. And take a look at it and just really get a, a nice survey, a nice wide survey of just how smart um, the animals of this world really are. So thank you for watching Smart Animal Planet. I hope um, this has been educational and enjoyable for you. It's really been fascinating to just see the different kinds of, of skills uh, and, and intelligences that animals display. It's not just um, the usual. Ah, thank you for saying that. I'm, I'm glad uh, that you learned. Believe me, I, I learn a lot doing the show as well. So thank you. That's it for another episode of Wag of the Tail, Mondays at 8 a.m. Pacific on Facebook forward slash The Pet Scope. Get the schedule at thepetscopetv.com. Um, you can get replays and all my show notes at wagofthetail.live, which is just a category on my blog at thepetuncle.com. Uh, it's also on Medium, and you can um, see uh, the Style Pet Store on Facebook at Style Pets Boutique. I'm Randy Lyman, The Pet Uncle. Follow me on Twitter, the web, uh, and email. Thank you again for watching. I will see you on the next show. Uh, and everyone, have a great um, Monday and a great rest of your week.